and welcome to Open Source Governance. I'm your host Pendar and we are going to listen to the first episode of Open Source Governance. In this episode, we're going to briefly talk about the representative system, its history a little bit, uh, its flaws and its problems and also talk about why there is an urgent need for a direct democracy as opposed to the representative system that is currently in place in many parts of the world. I mentioned by the end of the episode zero that in this episode we're going to talk about governmentality and what Michel Foucault thinks about uh, this term and how he introduces it. What I thought is maybe more interesting or more helpful to first talk about why do we need to rethink the whole representative system from the first place and then introduce these new terms. So what is a representative system? In a representative system, there is a whole community and the community is consisting of different groups. Let's say if there is a country, there is different states or different provinces that they all act individually. And these smaller communities work together to form a bigger community, which is the whole society. But the decisions cannot be made by one part of this land or this society for everybody else. So these smaller communities, they want to collaborate with each other and use each other's benefit and be under basically one agreement where they can work together and trade together and protect each other. So for that, they need legislation. Legislation basically binds the whole community together and acts as a reference point where whenever there's something in question, you can go back to it and make a reference and then solve the problem. In the old days, this legislation was made by a monarch, a king, with advice from elder men or advisors or influential people who had a lot of money and were wealthy and had a giant network. And basically they were making the decision for all of these communities. They were collecting taxes and they were offering protection whenever there was a war. They were trading and distributing the goods among the people and they would take care of the judicial system. And whenever there was a fight, they would have to go to all these people who were at the top and they would just basically make all of the calls. So basically a monarchy system or an oligarchy one was the judiciary system, the executive system and the legislative system. And all of the calls were made at the top. This system would make it very difficult for any interaction or for the people to question that system or to be part of this process of making decisions over what is going to happen for them or to them and how everything is decided and uh, put into practice, basically. So what the representative system does is that from those smaller communities, the people of that community would select somebody to send over to a central place where the decisions are made to represent them and to defend their rights and to stand for them. That representative then will become the voice of their community. The historians track this back as far as the 900s where the Vikings would send their representatives to a central decision-making place Funny or not, this decision-making place in the Viking Age was called The Thing, which was a large gathering or a meeting of all these representative Vikings who were coming from different tribes, and they would yield down their weapon, and they would 
be in peace and they would talk and then they would make decisions and they would abide by those decisions more famously in england in the 12th century william the conqueror was seeking advice from the landowners which was called a feudal system and he would take those advices into practice and uh, later henry promoted the system a little bit into a bit more familiar to what we know now and later in the 15th century the parliament of england was created still with a lot of influence from the kings but a bit more representative than it was before and then in the 18th century when england and scotland united politically it became the parliament of great britain these examples are of course based on western historical references but there is a lot of more stuff going on in the east and in central and west asia and other parts of the world but we don't want to open the misrepresentation of history by the western historians so let's just skip that part and stick to these examples for now So in the modern or contemporary uh, governing, we have three branches, the legislative branch, the executive branch, and the judiciary branch. The legislative branch is basically the parliament and all representatives come together, somebody initiates a law and then they talk about it, they are either pro or for that law and they come up with their arguments and then they will vote over the passing or not passing of that law and then if that law is passed then it becomes rule and then that rule goes to either the judiciary system that implements it in the court whenever there is a, a disagreement over something and somebody needs to solve the issue for the two parties and also the legislation goes to the executive branch which is performing everything that is done executive wise so the legislation makes sure that the executive branch is abiding by the framework that is defined from the legislative system this interactive action is called checks and balances these three branches do checks on each other and make each other balanced so the same way that the legislative system is checking on the executive branch the executive branch also has powers to check on the legislative system and this makes sure that there is not excessive power staying on one side and not on the other side so these three branches work together constantly to keep it democratic and safe and fair So then what's wrong with the representative system? What are its problems? Where does it lack something and how could it be not serving its initial purpose? As far as we know, the closest thing to democracy at the moment is the representative system because everybody will have a say in choosing somebody to talk for them. Not everybody needs to be completely informed or should have the responsibility to decide over a matter that maybe doesn't fall under their speciality. One might argue that why not let the politicians do their own job? Uh, they are trained for this. They have been educated for this and they know what they are talking about. They come from experience and they know how to manage certain problems. 
and ordinary people are not eligible enough to be able to make such calls for laws and legislation system and to decide over matters that are so complicated that maybe somebody who doesn't really have a knowledge about that could make a wrong call about that, which is completely a valid point. It does make sense that you should let somebody who knows how to do a job do a job. You won't go to a blacksmith to fix your teeth or you won't go to the doctor to fix your plumping in the house. Everybody is educated and trained to do their own job. But before that, let me tell you what problems there are with the representative system at the moment. Basically, the parliament where the decisions are made and turned into the law is usually composed of several parties, political parties. These political parties, they take seats and they, try, they always try to become more and reserve more seats in the parliament so that they can more easily pass laws that are in line with their party's disciplines or to be against the laws that are not in line with their disciplines. Parties use a lot of money for campaigning whenever there is an election coming and they propagate their aims and their agenda and they make some promises and then in order to be elected again they have to be fulfilling those promises otherwise they won't get the votes. At least this is how democracy should work. I'm talking about a democratic example. I'm not talking about that uh, authoritarian regime where there's one or two parties that will get the vote no matter what. So what happens when there's parties and they are competing each other for the votes of the people? Um, they use different techniques to get the votes. Some of them are ethical, some of them are not. But in any case, they need money for advertising their agenda and to get their aims to be heard and their agenda to be listened to. And where does this money come from? The money comes from supporters. Supporters uh, could be either completely on donation base, it could be completely funded by the people, or it could come from a company that has an interest and they need to serve that interest. So for that, they go to a party that can help them get a law passed or not passed so that they can continue benefiting on what they want to do or what they are doing, and they want to keep doing that. This could be companies that produce a certain product or an individual who's looking for future possible political gains for themselves or any other case. So politicians need to be elected, they need the money. These companies or individuals, they have the money. And for them to be elected, they have to listen to what they want from them because they have the money. So they promise something. They promise, okay, if there is a law going to be passed about uh, something that you're concerned with, I'm going to do whatever you say. For example, the National Rifle Association in the United States, or NRA, they of course, are interested in selling weapons. So they go talk to most possibly Republican senators or representatives who want to be elected. And they say, look, we'll give you like $1 million and you can cover your costs for the election. But then when there, whenever there is a law regarding the gun law, you have to just follow our lead. This is called lobbying. And lobbying is one of the biggest flaws within the representative system because it means that a political party basically has an owner and they have to listen to whatever they say. Otherwise, no more money. And that is what corruption means, basically. You often hear about cases that a law is not being passed for years and years because some people in the parliament are against that or... Sometimes you see that a law is passed so fast that you d wouldn't even realize. And then it leaves you with a shock that how did it even happen? When? Like what? <laughs> and this is usually what makes the legislation process so frustrating sometimes. When something really needs to be done and everybody knows it and everybody seems to be agreeing that 
okay, this is not logical, we have to pass this law, but some representatives just say no every time without really a good reason and they just try to explain themselves over and over while they know and you know that they know that they are just being not reasonable. But it wouldn't matter because that law wouldn't pass. And this fight between parties eventually makes the representative system not really competent to do their own job. Even if they are educated, even if they are experienced, it couldn't work. Sometimes it just couldn't work because the majority may be against that and only because of money, because of lobbying. So lobbying, in my point of view, is one of the main reasons why the representative system is not as efficient as it should be. Maybe it did work in the past. Maybe in the past there was no such big companies or the capitalism machine wasn't this active, so the companies or individuals couldn't really influence the representatives as much as now. But now this is pretty much the case. Another reason for why representative system is not the most efficient system out there is personal motivations. If people elect the most eligible person for a job as a representative, but then that person is faced with a choice that is really an ethical question or something that triggers something personal based on the personal experience of that person, and uh, then when it comes the time for decision, that person could be making a judgment because of their own experience or their background. And this judgment might not really reflect what is best for the interests of the people. Everybody knows that people can make mistakes and uh, personal interpretations of different uh, issues are different from one another. So if you're choosing a person to represent you, uh, that person could be wrong sometimes. For example, if I'm a man and I'm really against uh, abortion, I can be making a choice for women who need to be having an abortion. First of all, I'm not a woman, so I don't know what it means to give birth. And second, I'm making a decision for somebody else that is completely personal. Maybe my religion doesn't allow abortion and uh, I want to make that call for everybody other than me. But maybe some of the people who I am representing, they are not religious and they, they want to be able to do what they want. So then this is uh, my personal point of view over everybody else's. And this takes us to the third point, which is the ethical dilemma. Ethical dilemma is when you have to make a call that is really not clear which one of the options are valid or make sense. And uh, both of them are ethically right or wrong. And you just have to make a call that is too close to be called. And in both ways, you could be making a mistake. For example, to decide what to do with the nuclear waste and there is a law that's going to be passed about that and uh, a representative could easily make uh, one of the two choices and both of them could be wrong. Imagine the two choices are should we dump the waste in the ocean or should we put them in the ground or should we send it to a third country that is poor and they for, for some money they just are accepting to take our nuclear waste. None of these options are really a nice thing to do, but you have to take care of it because it's there and it's to disappear. Uh, so what to do with it? And again, this representative has to make a choice that is personal and is based on their own judgment and their background. 
Another issue is party principles. Imagine the choices for parties are not as various as they should be. For example, in the United States, there's two major parties, Democrats and Republicans. Each of these parties have their own party principles, and if you want to join them, you have to accept those principles. But what does it mean? Do you have to accept all of those principles, or can you interpret it on, on your own, or, or what? Will they kick you out if you disagree with some of the principles? And the answer is usually yes, they will kick you out. So if you are joining a party as a representative, you have to be following those principles and you have to f stick to that agenda. And what it means is that the principles are also limiting the decisions that are made by the representatives. Another limitation and a flaw in representative system. Another possible problem within the representative system could be the lack of efficiency in deciding over matters that concern minorities or regions, simply because those people or those representatives are not in the majority, so they can never pass the law that they need to. And their livelihood or the way they function within the society really depends on that law to be passed. For example, if Native Americans, they want to pass a law that limits the extraction of some minerals from their region and they need to pass a law to limit that they can't get the votes of everybody else so that keeps on going and they keep losing their jobs and houses and uh, their livelihood is ruined then simply because the majority are not native americans or they don't really care what's going on in that region and then it's not a priority the question of priority is always a problem within the parliament because some issues are not valid enough or important enough to be prioritized over other issues. So, so less important issues are always pushed back and these issues are always waiting to be called or uh, waiting for a time that there is no crisis. So then they can raise this question again and not to get the votes again. So you can see how frustrating it might become for the people who are concerned with that problem. And lastly, and most importantly, is the question of passivity of the people in this whole process. Within the representative system, the citizens or the members of a society, they get to choose somebody who represent them. That means to tick a box next to a name, let's say every four years, and choose somebody who chooses for them. So this is like a layered kind of democracy. And the knowledge of knowing that you are really not directly involved in decisions can slowly make you passive as a citizen and not caring about what the outcome is. That makes you want to educate yourself less and not be involved within this whole process. When you're ticking a box next to a name, you're not even deciding over the content. You're deciding over a name, who you're hoping that could fairly represent you and to me this defines complete hopelessness and passivity many scientists and critics they argue that at the moment we have all the tools necessary for involving the people and informing the people to be able to make the calls themselves representative system is hundreds, literally hundreds of years old, and we're still using it. And we have the internet, we have the blockchain system, and we came up with all these nice algorithms or um, different technologies that could secure or ensure a fair, all-inclusive democratic process. We're just not using them because we're at the moment a bit too afraid to change. And of course, the politicians would not let that happen because uh, then they would lose a job. But this is not only about parliaments. We're not talking about politicians only. We're not talking about governments only. We are talking about every system, institutions and companies, wherever the representative system is implemented. We're talking about top-bottom approach. We are talking about hierarchical systems that always dictate the order from the top to bottom. 
where the main work is done by the people at the bottom and the benefit is really taken by the people at the top. Open source governance is not trying to be a radical, crazy project. It's just trying to use the tools that are there and ready and experienced and proven to be right to be working in favor of a more clear and more efficient decision-making system. We're looking for a tool and a new mindset that can lubricate a better process of decision-making. So with that, I'm going to conclude the representative system and what I think is wrong with it. And for the next session, I will try to explain elections, referendums and the history of it, different techniques that are used and used to be used for making elections possible. And uh, we're also going to be a little bit criticizing that as well. And I will try to explain a little bit what happened within the project open source government and how we discussed possible different scenarios. If you enjoy this podcast, I encourage you to introduce it to other people and also subscribe to whatever channel is out there from Spotify and Apple and Amazon to Google and different platforms for podcasting. We have it all. Also, don't forget to take a look at our website, opensourcegovernance.com. You can read a lot about more terms and notions that we're going to use in this podcast and to get some clue about what is the project generally about and uh, you can also follow our events and join them and be part of the conversation if you feel like helping you're more than welcome to use the donate link in our website and help us with any amount that you like. We have no supporters at this moment and just doing it out of love. So that is it for this episode. Thank you very much for staying with me and listening to this episode. I'm your host Pender and I wish you a very nice week and a month ahead until next episode, which I think will be released in February. Take care.